Today is day one of the July 96 seven-day retreat in Springwater. <laughs> and as usual, we will start talking. about a new kind of listening. Maybe not as usual, because words can come out of this moment, even though they may have said hundreds of times before always come out of this moment? Do they come out of a moment of freshly looking and listening? Regardless of what happened or what was said in the past. So, as for speaking, can it be for listening? Maybe the thought has already crossed the mind. I've heard this before. And often with this thought comes a tuning out. Because I already know what she's going to say. That's not this new kind of listening. New kind of listening comes of, out of not knowing this moment of unfolding in the presence. There's a, a slight movement of cool air. Can we feel it? The skin feels it as the birds are singing. These are not yesterday's birds. These are not the birds of five minutes ago or a minute ago. It's now freshly heard. The breathing Sometimes people say, listening to the breathing is too monotonous, too, mecha too mechanical, or there is knowing involved in what the breathing is, where it comes into the organism, through the nostrils. I already know too much about it. And this is how we live. We live in what we know about the breathing or about listening. But this working together, talking, listening together is not about something, even though this is how the words seem to represent it. It is putting into words what is happening now, before it is known. through memory, established in the past. So what is breathing this moment, this instant, of not knowing it? Not knowing nostrils or lungs or diaphragm. It takes a different listening, doesn't it? The organism intuits it. Listening this instant to beep, beep, and breathing is not knowing via the brain. It's doing it. It's happening as the breeze is rustling leaves and cooling skin.
with our bird song and breeze and breathing and heartbeat. This instant. Before the next thought about it arises, thoughts have a way of arising. There's a tremendous, tremendously strong habit of constantly creating the world in which we live through thinking about it. We live in a thought-out world. The fabric is thought and image and concept and, and memory and anticipation. And the strength of living in this world with its emotions, of course. There isn't a thought that crosses the mind without triggering some kind of sensation or emotion throughout the rest of the organism. That is the stuff that thoughts are made of, triggering the glands, the organs, the muscles, memory lodged in the bones, all the cells of the body. There's a memory lodged in it. And in this thought, emotion, memory, and future anticipation world created by this organism, we live most of the time so insulated from what is actually happening. Organismically, lively, naturally, which is our true home. Not thought created, but moment to moment created actual living happening in empty space. The empty space of not grabbing, not judging, not knowing, not identifying as mine or yours. That's what fills the space with conflict and problems and stuff. But innocently listening, without knowing, without judging, not grabbing or rejecting, empties the space of stuff. So that what is actually happening independent of thinking purifies itself. Maybe we've jumped far ahead, that's the way. We put it in language and need to look at how do we normally listen to a talk given in the mid-morning by a person one has read about or heard about or remembers from past such occasions, which means imagery has formed about the person who is giving the talk. How does one listen to a talk by a person one knows and has feelings about, judgments about, imagery about? Is all of that known stuff affecting the listening, this moment? what one likes to hear, what one wants to hear, what one expects to hear. Is there expectation in the mind right this moment? Oh. Previous moments and setting the mind and body in a certain direction, expecting something. 
body is set through this attitude of expectation. Can one discern it or begin to question it? We're not talking about bad things or wrong things. We're trying to come upon what is moving and triggering and presetting this organism at a moment of listening. Do I want something? Do I fear something? I'm afraid she will talk about this or that. Or I'm afraid my expectations may not be fulfilled. Is that there someplace? Maybe not for this talk, but for another talk, or listening to a friend or colleague. Expectations, wanting, fearing through preset imagery, which makes it near impossible to listen freshly this moment. This moment of a new universe. Also, is this body mind preconditioned to want to remember what is being said? Want to take notes? Sometimes people do bring notepads into a talk to jot down so one doesn't forget something that may be important. But it's a mindset that is involved with this which does not allow this free-floating openness of being with what is said and not just the words, because the words just point at something which is not verbal, which cannot be jotted down with pencil and paper, because it is a an entire wholesome state of being out of which words words are formed and informed so is there the habitual conditioned urge to grab on to to keep to take home which is detectable when there's an open inwardness to listen and look and discover all these sets of the body-mind. Which prevent this open relaxation of listening now. Not that it is wrong to want to remember. How can it be wrong? We are totally imbued with this impulse and has been very useful for our human survival. Not just survival, but it's a marvelous thing to see. Maybe some beautiful photographs of a place one saw and likes to look at them and the brain is so cooperative in evoking not just pictures and sounds but feelings and emotions as though the thing was happening right now. We're not condemning it, we're not blaming it or finding fault, we're discovering how the urge to remember prevents the ease of simple being without instruments to keep it. We do, we do tape the talks, so it's possible to take it home on a tape and play it again. 
people have told me that particularly during the first talks, they hear, not that they remember very little memory isn't there at all because one didn't hear it. The mind drifted off or was drowsy. We talked last night about the sleepiness at the beginning of a retreat which is sort of like a withdrawal from all the daily stimulation, the overwork, the stresses and strains human beings go through all the time. And then when this is not present, one may go to sleep, maybe for the first time in weeks or months, people tell me this. I'm deliciously tired and can sleep. And that happens during talks too. <laughs> People used to tell me and still tell me, your talks get better on day four or five. I've wondered whether it is that one is more alert and present on day four or five than day one or two, although, of course, some talks grab one more than others. So, is it even possible to hear what is being said without imagery and memory immediately taking over or already having taken over. But it then remains to be discovered. The fact that an image arises about the person who is talking need not disrupt attention because it appears in attention as awareness of imagery, of body sets wanting something. That awareness reveals what's going on just as it reveals bird song and leaves rustling in the breeze. So it's not the question, can I get rid of this imagery? Can I Listen without memory, but is it possible that the memory not disturb? It's just seen as that, but it's also clear that what is remembered is not what is happening right now. And what's happening right now, I cannot know through memory. Is that clear? At least logically clear? What is happening this instant of breathing and cooling and birding and leafing is not what is presented in memory. Remembering it is not being here this instant, even though memory is here this instant. Memory is not yesterday, it's happening now just as the breeze in the trees and the breathing in this organism. Bird song is happening now just as memory is happening now. Can it be seen as such? <laughs> seen intelligently? I've got to say something about all these questions that pop up. It's good to bring it up right at the beginning, as it was brought up to me this morning by someone in a meeting. A person mentioned that the question last night in the opening talk, what is separation? Or where is the separation? And that was said out of a moment of listening together to the hum of an airplane motor and birds calling and breathing happening all at the same time, this moment. And then the question emerged, where is the separation? But the brain, the thinking process, picks up this question, where is the separation, and starts thinking about it getting involved in thought. Am I separate now that I'm also listening to airplane motor? And either this question is seen as thought activity 
without disturbing the listening to birds and motors, or else it becomes entangling, habitually entangling, involving, thinking more about myself here. Am I really here? Am I really listening? And lots of questions are furnished in a talk. So how, how do we listen to these questions that are popping up in a talk? Is it inevitable to become entangled in them through increasing thought activity? Or can there be a careful listening to questions and how the organism is about to pick it up and spin it out moving away from present listening in the light of a question. The question, where's the separation? Either leading to thoughts about myself, am I separate, am I not separate? And even voicing the I already establishes this me entity that suffers so much from separation and now is being questioned again and reinforced again? Or can a question, where is the separation? Plunge into a not knowing and listening a, a listening into not knowing space. Don't try to visualize not knowing space. It's impossible. But words are seductive, and that's the difficulty of holding talks. The brain, the thoughts get seduced into weaving more and more and more thought fabric. But it happens probably inevitably, to every human being who is interested in finding out truth, coming in touch with reality as it is, that possibility exists for all of us. Not to be totally entangled in thought, but for a moment to hear a bird without thinking, me or you or it or them. Just that ring, that ring. And the thought has not arisen yet bringing myself into relationship with that. Habitually it happens very quickly. Oh, I heard it. Or I can't hear it. This constant momentum of needing to bring what I think is me in relationship with what I see and hear or understand or don't understand. And it takes a while of doing this, what we call work of this moment, retreating and listening and entering quietness. It takes a while before it becomes less and less important for thought and emotion to bring me into the picture. The picture is sufficient without that. Thought can relax, take it easy, take a vacation. And the moment thought does not bring me into the picture, there is no me. There is only what is happening totally wholesomely until thought may say now do I have it have I got it I have it or I don't have it and again spinning around that imaginary world of me and you and them and us which I don't think animals suffer from go about their business of animaling, eating, looking, jumping, running, mating, taking care, 
of the little ones. Without worrying about the future. So this is sort of an, an, an opening question. listening. What is it? Without becoming entangled in thinking about it. Not knowing, wondering. And allowing it to reveal itself by itself. Through buzzing flies and calling birds. And breath flowing in and out. The other thing we usually address in a first talk is this whole problem of authority, perpetuating authority, creating it in the first place. But perpetuating may be the better way of putting it because since we were born, we have been imbued with authority. Authority of the parents, of the older siblings, or younger siblings. Authority of teachers and priests and ministers. Schools, books. All of it Meaning, ultimately trusting at what some, somebody else says or wants at the expense of wondering and looking for oneself, to find out oneself. And we're not talking right now about the authority of biology texts. Obviously, one has to study and trust that the text is authentic. based on direct research into what is happening. I'm not talking about that kind of authority. I'm talking about coming here and assuming by habit that what is being talked about needs to be believed in, made into concepts and carried around. One may not even consciously or deliberately do it. It is so conditioned. So that people tell me, even when you talk about no authority, I make that into a concept. Or into an authority. My authority is no authority. So we're questioning whether any of that is really needed in this amazing unfolding of finding out for oneself what is happening inside and out. Even though granted, it has proven helpful to human beings to hear someone else put something into clear language, pointing at something not to be believed in but to be examined explored, discovered directly, not just by verbal transmission. So, just to examine and or come upon this image building brain, which makes ideas out of a teacher one's attitudes then toward the ideas, attitudes of following, of devotion, of defense, identification with it, 
my teacher, my, my teaching. Versus yours, which of course is either inferior or better, then I have to go there to identify with that. Is that what's going on? To examine oneself honestly. Not to, to get rid of tendencies, but to clarify them. That's all that's needed. Come into awareness. Our tremendous longing, yearning for authority. And at the same time fighting it tooth and nail. Wanting to be, wanting somebody to be my authority in whom I can believe, who I can follow and obey. And revolting, revolting against it. At the same time, maybe unconsciously or subconsciously. Because what is being displayed here, or uh, conveyed in words, and maybe voice intensity, coloring of voice, is not to convince people of something, but to invite to look together and alone, to see whether in fact it is so, that imagery builds up so quickly about another person, and then the brain and body deals with the imagery. It seems to be easier than constantly facing a new person who may not be conforming to the images. But we don't even find that out because it's so much more drilled into our behavior to remember the image and react to that. question it together, to question these rock, rock hard assumptions about ourselves and each other. So truth can reveal itself quietly, what we really are, when we have no images about each other, or those are just seen as photographs of the past. Sometimes people in the past have gotten angry when I've refused to be their authority, their teacher, their guide, even though I never refuse to open things up, to look at things together, and to hold these talks and meetings with an ever-renewing energy. But there has been anger about not getting what one wants, maybe has remembered from childhood. Somebody who knows, somebody who can lead one into a better future. It's all imagination. And when that is questioned, when it maybe collapses, then what is our relationship with each other? If not that expected one of student to teacher or follower to authority. These are all very well-defined relationships. And without this kind of traditional definition, what are we to each other? How do we relate in a fresh way? we can supply all kinds of concepts, but I don't want to slip into this concept level of, of relating to each other. 
So when I say right now that relationship among us can be one of respect, respecting each other. Is that, does that become a concept? Or can one question whether one's relationship to another person, not, not necessarily to Tony, but to him or her, is that one of respect? Meaning, looking freshly, respecting, looking anew at this person, which, whichever way they are at this point in time, it will be different at another point in time. Because we're never completely the same from one moment to another, except that thought holds us in rigid patterns. So, in talking with each other, if we have a group meeting, right now we're just in retreat life, writing a note to someone or receiving a note, does it, does it arise out of respect? and yet communicating <clears throat> what needs to be communicated. And is it, is it received, read or heard with respect to the writer or speaker? Which implies, doesn't it, this unpreoccupied, fresh listening and looking. This moment wind breezing. Crows cawing. And breath flowing. We will end here for today.